Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to another episode of HIDAC webinars. Uh, my name is Ali Nijat. I'm HIDAC's uh, National Development Manager for Industrial Hydraulics. Uh, and I'm also an ASIP certified pressure vessel inspector. Uh, due to the popular demand, this episode of the webinar is uh, allocated to the rules and regulations pertaining pressure vessels uh, in Australia. Uh, now, just a couple of quick uh, disclaimers before we actually get to the content of the webinar. Uh, uh, this webinar is going to take a little bit longer than uh, than advertised. I think it was originally advertised for uh, 20 to 25 minutes, but because we're covering quite a bit of a content, uh, uh, it's probably going to take up to 45, 60 minutes uh, with all the questions and answers at the end of the webinar. Um, so feel free to uh, grab a cup of coffee in Australia. We love our coffees. Uh, I'm sure it's five o'clock somewhere else in the world. So if you want to grab a beer or a glass of wine or you know whatever you uh, you fancy having over the next 45 minutes to an hour, please help yourself. It's time to uh, get comfortable and get settled. Uh, and uh, yeah, just enjoy the content. Uh, another important disclaimer that we need to make is that the content provided in this webinar is for information purpose only uh, and it's for general guidelines and it's ultimately the owners uh, in this particular case we're talking about pressure vessels the owner of the pressure vessel responsibility to ensure uh, all the applicable rules and regulations applicable to uh, that particular country or state or wherever you are is uh, is adhered to uh, and also important to bear in mind that you know when we talk about pressure vessels, if there is any damage or any any issue caused by the first pressure vessel to the property around it, to the health of personnel, uh, the responsibility of that remains uh, to be the owners. And also, the content of this webinar is very much intended for Australian market. So, if you're watching this webinar from other countries like Brazil or Turkey or uh, somewhere in Europe. Uh, you're going to have to go and look for your standards and rules and regulations applicable in those countries. So without further ado, let's have a look at the content of this webinar. We, we uh, start with uh, elaborating on some definitions around the pressure vessels. Uh, we move into the regulations and, uh, and regulatory uh, rules and, and whatever is in place in terms of regulating pressure vessels in Australia. That comes very closely hand in hand with uh, hazard level associated to the pressure vessels and calculating the hazard levels of pressure vessels. From there, we look at the obligations of both owners and suppliers of the pressure vessels. Uh, we have a look at the registration process and the documentation involved in uh, doing different types of registrations, whether it's a design registration or item of the plant registration. We will cover that in this webinar too. Uh, and ultimately, we will have a look at the owner's responsibilities. Uh, what are your responsibilities if you own a pressure vessel? And also, as an important part of that is, is the inspection processes and what's uh, involved in that. So let's have a look at the definitions. I think the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about pressure vessels is what is a pressure vessel and how can we define and put it in a very, very uh, uh, defined uh, frameworks as to what is a pressure vessel and when and at what point uh, we need to start complying with all those rules and regulations uh, pertaining to a particular vessel. So let's have a look at some definitions from standards. Uh, AS 1200, or rather AS NZS. AS NZS uh, typically are standards which are uh, joint shared standards between Australia and New Zealand. In this particular case, AS 1200, or AS NZS 1200, is very much about promoting safety around the use of pressure vessels. Uh, and creating some uniformities in terms of design requirements, test requirements, construction, fabrication of pressure vessels. It's basically general requirements around around pressure vessels. Uh, AS12, oh, again, I have to correct myself, ASNZS 1200 offers a definition here for pressure vessels. They do refer to a pressure vessel 
uh, as a vessel subject to internal or external pressure. And that includes all the fittings and associated, uh, you know, valves, gauges and everything uh, up to the first point of connection uh, to the piping. While accurate, I personally think there are better definitions for pressure vessels. So I searched a little bit more and I came across this one in AS1210. AS1210 is an Australian stan standard or, or a design code for de designing pressure vessels. Uh, if, I want, if I want to start designing a pressure vessel from scratch, I grab this design code and I start basically choosing material uh, and sticking with all these requirements for designing the vessel itself. At right at the beginning of the standard, they also uh, offer or suggest uh, another method of identifying whether a particular vessel is a pressure vessel or not. Uh, they very much put it down to a curve uh, or a graph, uh, which you can see on the screen. Uh, the x-axis of this graph is the inside diameter of the vessel in meter. So we're looking at vessels up to 30 meter diameter, pretty big. And uh, the, the y-axis is internal pressure in kPa. So please do remember, this is KPA, very, very low pressure, right? Talking about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 KPA. 50 KPA is pretty much like half a bar, effectively very, very low, half the atmosphere pressure. And they offer this curve and they state that if, if the pressure inside a vessel of a certain diameter falls under, anywhere under this curve, that means the vessel that we've got in hand is in fact a pressure vessel. And if anything falls above this curve, then, sorry, if it, if it falls under, it's not a pressure vessel. And if it's above the, above the curve itself, it is a pressure vessel. Now, given that we're talking about very, very low pressures here, right? And over a very large diameter, you can, you can assume pretty much anything that uh, has a slight amount of pressure in there can be potentially categorized as a pressure vessel. But does the rules and regulations apply to it? Uh, we'll soon find out. So this is a standard. The standards are open to interpretation and are not compulsory and mandatory to uh, for adherence, right? But uh, as far as mandatory uh, acts are concerned, we look at the uh, OHNS Act, uh, which is again a mandatory uh, regulatory document. Uh, and as part of the OHNS Act, uh, they define pressure equipment uh, being the boilers and pressure vessels and pressure pipings, uh, the vessels with hazard level nature. And we'll get to what hazard level is in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, but what they define a pressure vessel is any vessel of a hazard level of a, B, C, or D, according to the criteria identified in AS3920 Part 1, right? Now, we'll get to what the hazard level is and how we calculate it in a, in a few slides, but just for now, bear in mind that we consider a vessel to be a pressure vessel if their hazard level is any of the above, A, B, C, or D. Now, how does that relate to the fluid power or hydraulics industry, right? Because pressure vessels can be very broad. You know, we can talk about, uh, I don't know, uh, multi-megawatt boilers. We can talk about air receivers. We can talk about autoclaves. We can talk about uh, hydraulic accumulators in our case. But it's important for us to understand how is our industry concerned uh, when it comes to these rules and regulations. So first thing comes to mind, uh, is hydraulic accumulators. We know uh, very well that accumulators are considered pressure vessels and there are certain uh, regulatory obligations associated with hydraulic accumulators. Another uh, type of a vessel, which is a bit less regarded as pressure vessel in the industry, but in certain cases they in fact are as hazardous as a hydraulic accumulator is, uh, filters and the filter housing. If you've got a filter housing of a very large uh, volume and uh, high design pressure, potentially we also have a pressure vessel in hand. 
also when it comes to filtration you know it's not only oil filtration uh, on the right hand side of your screen you can see a bulk uh, diesel filter housing so this particular vessel is also considered to be a to be a pressure vessel because it's quite large and it's got a relatively high design pressure so this is pretty much where hydraulic and fluid power industry is concerned as far as the actual uh, pressure vessel rules and regulation compliance goes. So let's have a look at the regulations. First question that comes to mind is why do we actually need regulations for pressure vessels? So important to note that pressure vessels are everywhere, right? They're in household applications, they are in hospitals, they're in mines, in refineries, in also the different factories around the joint, you know. And also they do store quite a significant amount of energy in the format of pressurized fluid, right? Now, if there is a damage to, to a pressure vessel, the more energy released as, as a result of that damage, uh, the higher the extent of uh, damage and catastrophe effect to the to the plant and to the to the property around the vessel and the, to the health of personnel around it. Uh, so you can't quite take that uh, lightly, uh, and you have to be very careful. And that that's why we've got regulations in place to to govern the the way that we use and we look after the pressure vessels in uh, in our plants. And also important to note that. Accidents around pressure vessels happen quite often. You know, you'd be surprised if you if you Google, if you have a look at the news uh, and about pressure vessel accidents, they actually do happen quite regularly. Some of these accidents, I put some photos down here, you can have a look. This one here was uh, actually happened when they were trying to, they did a hydro test uh, on, this, on this tanker. And then when they wanted to drain the fluid after the hydro test, they forgot to uh, open the vent and the vacuum just collapsed this chamber here. So imagine if someone was standing around it, they would have gotten a big fright, I would tend to think. And here we've got some heat exchangers. You can see the explosion of a heat exchanger it can actually just bring down uh, the entire factory. So it's so really important to, to look after them and make sure they are in a good nick. Now, what are the regulations? As we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the regulations pertaining pressure vessels, they fall under the Work Health and Safety Act. The Work Health and Safety Act has two parts. One is the Work Health and Safety Regulations, which are mandatory part of it. And another one is the approved codes of practices and standards. So having a closer look at the approved codes of practices and standards, there are some important standards in there. First and foremost is AS4343. That is to calculate the hazard level associated with a pressure vessel. We, when we start working, designing, fabricating pressure vessels, the first thing that we look at is the hazardous nature uh, of the pressure vessel and the hazard level associated with it. From there, we, we typically decide what material to use, what class of the vessel we're designing, what tests we have to we have to do on the vessel, uh, what inspection regime we'll have to put in there, what documentation is uh, involved in uh, you know fabrication, design, and inspection of a, of that particular vessel. So very important one, AS forty three forty three. Uh, next one is the AS twelve ten, which is an Australian standard for designing. The pressure vessel. So it's basically a design code. It said, as a designer, if I want to design a pressure vessel, I grab a copy of AS1210. I show I choose my material from the code. I choose the right thickness, safety factors, diameter, uh, supports, flanges, you know, anything that is associated with a pressure vessel is designed in accordance with our AS1210. Next one is uh, AS4037. Uh, it outlines the requirements for testing pressure vessels, testing including things like hydrostatic pressure tests or pneumatic tests. We typically don't want to do that, but it's also in there. Uh, non-destructive tests. You know, if there is a 
NDT, like MAC particle testing or, or, or dye penetration or X-ray or anything as such, the requirements of all this testing and the procedures are, are stipulated in 4037. And we got AS3788, uh, which is uh, an important standard outlining the scope of uh, inspections around the pressure vessels. And we've got some other organizations like uh, National Occupational Health and Safety Commission, who actually, again, uh, these guys are responsible for enforcing and implementing the OHNS Act uh, across the country. And as part of what they do, uh, they also do talk about uh, pressure vessels and what's involved in having one in your plants. So let's start with our 4343 and the hazard level calculation. Again, very, very important to remember that uh, with 4343, or when we, when we want to start designing a pressure vessel, the first thing we look at is the hazard level of the vessel. And that defines the design parameters, the manufacturing uh, processes, the inspection regime, the conformity assessment that we need to have in place, and ultimately, uh using and disposing the uh the pressure equipment right uh they are pretty much the objectives of as4343 uh also you know when we actually calculate the the hazard level it gives us some ideas to what levels of control uh, for safety purposes and risk management we have to have in place uh, if we need to uh, follow a certain registration processes, whether it's a design registration or item of a plan registration. And also, it does provide a basis for your in-service inspection. So let's have a look at this hazard level and understand what it is about. So AS4343 uh, provides you, or the new version of it, which was uh, out in 2014, and provides you with a numerical method of calculating the hazard level. It's a very, very simple formula, which is the the, the backbone of this standard. You know, we don't really need to be a rocket scientist or a mathematician to understand this formula. It's just basically multiplying a bunch of factors and numbers uh, together and coming up with a hazard level. So H represents the hazard level value in megapascal liter. Then we've got the P, which is the design pressure. And again, please take note of the units of measurement. In this case, we've got megapascal. Uh, so the design pressure in megapascal. And also we've got the volume in, in liter. Uh, yeah, the volume is also quite important. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, as, as you can see, it's, a, it's one of the main factors in these calculations here, right? Uh, so sometimes people uh, come back and say, hey, we've got a very small vessel. Uh, does that mean that we actually don't need compliance? But it all comes down to this formula and just putting the correct values in the formula and calculating uh, the hazard level value. Also, another thing to, to note here is uh, the, 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 the value P, which is the design pressure. So again, uh, some of our clients may come back and say, look, you know, yeah, we know this is a 400 bar rated vessel, but in our application, we only uh, use it up to the working pressure of 10 bar. Do we need compliance? Really, as a designer, when we start designing a particular vessel, we don't really look at the operating pressure because you can imagine a certain design is applied to thousands of different vessels around the world, and we don't really know uh, the uh, working pressure of each and every one of them. So we have to nominate a design pressure and do our calculations based on that. And everyone will have to comply with that particular, you know, uh, rules and uh, standards that come with that uh, particular design pressure. So again, design pressure, volume, and we've got a bunch of correction factors here. FC, FF, and FS. All right, let's have a, have a look at each and every one of these ones and understand what they are. So FC, C for uh, compressibility. Um, so this is a correction factor that we use for different types of, uh, you know, compressibility factors, if you will. Uh, so we will use a value of 0 0.1 for vacuum. We'll use a value of 1 for liquid. 
and 10 for gas. We all know compressed gas is much more dangerous and hazardous than compressed liquid, right? Because gas is compressible. And that's why if you're filling up a vessel with, with gas, the nature of the hazard level or na the hazardous nature of that particular vessel is, is much higher. Next one is FF, which is the content factor. It's essentially what we put in that vessel, right? And it's again, not for us to decide what the nature of a particular content is. The standard AS4343, they write the back, they've got table, uh, tables full of different materials, uh, and they do stipulate the nature of each and every one of these material and uh, whether they are harmful or non-harmful or lethal. So as a guide, uh, we've got, we can divide nature of the hazard by three if you are using non-harmful non liquid. Excellent. Uh, for non-harmful gas, for example, nitrogen, let's bring it down to our world, the hydraulic accumulators, they are filled up with nitrogen, right? Nitrogen is a non-harmful gas, so we can use a factor of one, but gases may change their nature at different temperature. And again, the standards suggest if you've got a non-harmful gas, anything above 80 degrees Celsius, the nature of that gas will become actually harmful. So in that case, we'll have to use a fact, if I've got a vessel with a design temperature uh, uh, more than 80 degree and containing gas or non-harmful gas, uh, then I'll have to change my, my content factor to three for the harmful gas or harmful liquid. Then we will use a factor of 10 for very harmful liquid or gas, and we use a, a factor of 1,000 for lethal uh, liquid or gas. Very good. Next one is the location or service factor. You can imagine if you've got a buried vessel, for example, in the middle of a desert, if there is a damage, the, the, the effect of that damage is not going to be a, as catastrophic as uh you know if a particular vessel goes off in a in a refinery even a risk of fire or risk of explosion or uh, or thing as such you know so or for example if you've got a road tanker which is also considered a pressure vessel you know uh, their risk and the risk that they impose is much greater uh, than a small hydraulic accumulator in a cement mill for example right so uh, we look at a number of different factors uh, and by combining them, uh, if one of them is present, you know, we'll just we'll multiply that with three. If more than one is present, multiply it by 10. And we've got basically redu reduction factors if, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, remote locations or places that there is no human around the vessels and things like that. So we uh, factor in the location factor as such as well. So, um, then after we multiply all of those figures in each other, you know, there is a there is a numerical uh, method of categorizing these vessels to the, you know, in accordance with their hazard level. So there's some really strange numbers here, but uh, you can just put them in the calculators and come up with your numbers, like 10 to the power of 3 is 1,000. Uh, that's between 1,000 to 10,000, 10, hazard level C. Uh, anything more than 10,000, I think this is 3 million something, has a level B, and anything above that figure has a level A, right? Now, very important to, to note uh, this uh, disclaimer that they've put in there, that one hazard level is approximately equal to one kilojoule uh, of energy, which is also an equivalent of one gram of TNT. Now, I just did a quick calculation. Oh, maybe let's keep it here. I've got, I've got some examples here. Let's, let's take a 50 liter uh, accumulator. A high deck 50 liter accumulator is rated for 400 bar. So the design pressure is 40 megapascal or 400 bar. The volume is 50 liter, right? And we've got, again, the hazard level formula here and also the uh, hazard level selection criteria on this table down there. So, I've got a couple of examples here for you. Let's assume, uh, as for example one, that this vessel will contain some lethal liquid, can be anything, uh, and nitrogen, right? 
the location of it is on a road tanker in a refinery. So extra, extra hazard because refineries are major hazard facilities, a road tanker kind of transportable vessel, right? Uh, and the design temperature is 80 degrees. So FC, remember compressibility factor because we've got gas in there is 10. Uh, the content factor is, is also 10. Uh, and the location factor is is 10 as well. So because there we've got more than one of those hazard uh, situations uh, or, or critical situations present. If I calculate the hazard level with that formula, we are talking about hazard level of 2 million megapascal liter. And if I take that to this table, we are looking at hazard level B. But remember, one hazard level is one gram of, T, of, of TNT. 2 million hazard level is two tons of TNT. So that, that pressure vessel, if it's charged to its full capacity of 400 bar, does potentially uh, uh, ex uh, impose uh, a threat uh, equivalent to uh, two tons of TNT if it explodes. Another example is, let's assume the same vessel is filled up with water uh, and nitrogen. Location is a remote pump station in the middle of a desert and the design temperature is 80 degrees Celsius. So the content factor wouldn't change because we still have nitrogen in there. So compressibility, sorry, the compressibility factor uh, wouldn't change. Nitrogen, gas, so it's going to be 10. Uh, content factor, we've got uh, really non-harmful uh, liquid and gas in there. So we can use a uh, factor of one. And one third divided by three because it is in a remote area. If I calculate the hazard level on that basis, uh, we come up with hazard level C because it kind of falls between 1,000 to 10,000 here. Next example is if you've got a, uh, if you fill up the same accumulator with mineral oil and nitrogen, location is cement mill and design temperature. 100 degree. Again, we've got nitrogen in there, so compressibility factor is 10. Uh, the content factor is, is increased to 3 because both mineral oil and nitrogen above 80 degrees, so please uh, note the 100 degrees Celsius desired temperature, so the content factor uh, will increase to 3. And the location factor, cement mill is not a major hazard facility as such, so you can use just a standard one look for the for the uh, location factor and if you calculate the hazard level on that basis we're looking at hazard level b again again if you convert that to to the tnt equivalent that's 60 kilogram of tnt i always enjoy putting that in perspective uh, so what's going to happen there all right now uh, when we calculate our hazard levels, what are we going to do next? Let's say we've got to have, you know, in the previous cases, we came up with hazard level B and C. What are we going to do next? So, again, we look at the Workplace Health and Safety Regulation Act 2011 to decide what we have to do with a particular vessel uh, of a particular hazard level. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the WHS uh, Act uh, is the mandatory uh, regulations that we have to we have to stick with, right? So, as part of the Act, what they state is the plants that are considered to be, be high risk must be design registered, item registered, and also they have to have a record of documents documentation and inspection and you know the, the owners have to maintain a good records of all these all this information all right again what does that mean moving on under the same act uh, as part of schedule five part one they do ask for the design of the pressure vessels of the hazards level nature a b c and d for the design to be registered. So if we calculate our hazard level and we come up with any of these figures, A, B, C, or D, we'll have to register the design of our vessel. Now, again, the same act under Schedule 5, Part 2. They're calling for item of the plant registration for vessels with a hazard level nature of A, B, or C. So if you've got if you calculate our hazard level as per AS 4343 to AB, uh, 
uh, or C, then we'll have to register uh, that particular vessel as an item of a plant. That expect, that except obviously gas cylinders, LPG fuel vessels, and also serially produced vessels. What does that mean? Well, uh, serially produced vessels are typically your fire extinguishing capsules or or in our world again, uh, they are from accumulators which are produced serially through some uh, serial production methods and with a bit of trace traceability with their serial numbers and everything. You don't, you don't really need to register them as items of the plant if they are serially produced vessels, but you still need to do your design registration prior to manufacturing or in some cases, retrospective design registration. We'll get to that. Now, you remember we spoke about uh, NOSH or National Occupational Health and Safety Commission. Uh, this is a uh, regulatory body uh, by Commonwealth government to actually facilitate and implement the national uh, OHS strategy across the country, right? They have a national standard uh, by the name of NOSH 1010. Under its Scheduled 1, uh, again, they're asking for uh, some particular uh, actions uh, around pressure vessels with a particular uh, hazard level nature. So again, under Schedule 1, uh, they're stating the same thing, that if you've got a pressure vessel with the nature of hazard level A, B, C, D, you do require to register its design. And also, uh, any vessel with a hazard level A, B, or C, you need to register them as the item of the plant. So again, the same information reiterated here. Now, what happens if, if you fail to comply? We just buy a vessel, I don't know, imported from overseas without proper certification, put it in operation without uh, registering it as an item of a plant, uh, well, fines and and uh, you know the implications of that is is one thing, but we are really uh, imposing some risk and threat to the life of the person around, and also to the operation and to the to the property around that particular vessel. The fines can be up to sixty four thousand dollars, so quite significant. So it's important to to do your due diligence before buying a machine with a pressure vessel on it or before buying a pressure vessel, you need to make sure that you've got all those regulatory uh, obligations uh, fulfilled and you've got proper documentations in place. Now, we talked about registration, uh, but we need to understand what's involved in, uh, in having the design of a pressure vessel registered and also having it registered as an item of a plant. What documentations are involved in that? So very important. So step one really is kind of uh, sitting with the suppliers of the vessel or you as the, as the owner or purchaser of the vessel, you will have to demand this, right? Is actually getting a vessel which has a design in accordance to a valid design code. What does that mean? What is the most recognized Australian valid design code for pressure vessels? AS1210. But Australia does, in fact, recognize other design codes such as ASME uh, 8 Division 1, uh, which is a very much a North American standard, but applicable, you know, pretty much in quite a number of different countries around the globe. 82000 being a European code or PD5500 being the British code uh, and a bunch of other other design codes. Uh, what Australian uh, regulatory uh, authorities state is if you design your vessel in accordance with any of these recognized standards, you can still perform that design registration process in Australia against those foreign standards. So you don't really need AS1210 certification. You need certification, but the certification has to be in accordance with valid design codes. So I've got a couple of examples for you here. So remember, first step is designing in accordance with a particular design code. So this is a vessel that was designed here in Hydeck, Australia. So, uh, and it was designed, as you can notice here, uh, to AS 1210 2010. 
So we designed this vessel. First thing we did was actually just grabbing a copy of the code. We made sure that the material that we selected uh, was listed in the standard. We did our hazard level calculations down here. It came up to be a uh, hazard level C. And as a result of that, we chose the class of the vessel uh, and a bunch of other design parameters like the design pressure, design temperature, you know, the content of it being diesel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then once we finished our design process, we stayed that on the vessel's drawing. So here we've got the design code is AS1210. So anyone who look at the design of this vessel, they will know that it was designed to this particular code. Now, this design code can be anything else, can be ASME 8 Division 1, can be AD2000, PD5500, or, or similar uh, recognized standards in Australia. Next step is, once I'm, I've uh, completed my design to a particular code, then I will have to, again, I have to engage a, a verifying body to verify the work that I've done. Now, if the vessel has a hazard level of C or D, so lower hazards, right? And if I have a certified quality process like ISO or similar in place, then I can do the verification process internally. But if you've got a pressure vessel with hazard level of A or A and B, which are higher hazard levels, then by law, I am obliged to engage a third party design verifier in the process and get them to do the due diligence on, what, on the work that I've done. So typically what they do, they get my design in a format of a drawing or design calculations. They grab a code, the design code, whatever I've nominated it to be. It can be AS1210 or, or ASME or AD or PD or anything. And they cross-reference the work that I've done with the standard. And if everything is in order and in compliance, what they will do, they will issue a design verification certificate. A design verification certificate has a format very similar to what you can see on, on the screen. So they've got the information of the vessel up here and they do state the design code. Now I have deliberately chosen a design verification certificate uh, for a design which wasn't actually AS1210. Just to show you that uh, in Australia, you can get the design verified and registered against other standards as well. So this design verification is in accordance with AD2000, right? And then we state also different design parameters, again, design pressure, design temperature, test pressure, hazard level, and everything is, is stipulated on this, on this design verification certificate. Next step is sending all that information to the regulatory authorities, in our case being WorkSafe, right? And what they will do is just they make sure that, okay, I have a person in Australia who's responsible for the design or importing this vessel. I have another company who is a design verifier. They've done their due diligence. And I do check my, uh, I do I do my due diligence and check it through some engineering processes that I've got in place. And again, if everything is in order, I will issue what we call a design registration letter. It looks very similar to this. Again, I've, I've chosen the same, de the same design with the same design registration letter and the same design code. You can see the design code here is 82,000. So WorkSafe does and will provide you with design registration letters in accordance with other foreign design codes as long as they are recognized in Australia. And uh, again, you can see the identification of the vessel, uh, some design uh, and operational parameters here, like a hazard level, temperature, volume, you know, uh, pressure and everything. And as part of that, they give you a number, which is called registration number, right? Now, I may pause here for a second because we are often asked to provide uh australian certifications for a particular vessel now you can argue this either of a two way you can say all right what do you mean by uh, australian certifications for me as a pressure vessel inspector the only thing that would suffice my argument is a design registration letter i do not care if the design 
has been done to a foreign code. In my eyes, if a regulatory authority such as WorkSafe has accepted the uh, particular foreign design code, that code is very much applicable uh, and operational in Australia, right? So if you come to me and say, Ali, I want a design uh, of an Australian certification for this vessel, what I would offer to you is a design registration letter. Now, some people and some factory, and, and correctly so, and that's understandable, they only accept the design of the vessel to, to Australian codes, in this case, AS1210. That's also acceptable, but that has to be identified and stipulated right up front before we manufacture the vessel. Because if I design a vessel to ASME, for example, the design parameters are quite different to a vessel which is designed to AS1210. So I cannot go back and retrospectively design register that vessel to another code because the design was actually done to to some other other codes and we can't do it retrospectively so very important that when you when you're asking for uh, australian certification you clearly identify whether you are after a design registration or you're looking for uh, for compliance to as 1210 or other australian uh, standards now, step four, now I've got my design registration, design of the vessel registered, and it's all good to go. So I go ahead with my manufacturing, and I uh, put an identification label on my, on my vessel, as you can note here. This is going to be a permanent marking, and this permanent marking will uh, uh, basically indicate some information such as most important registration number because the inspector will look at that. Uh, design pressure, test pressure, design temperature, serial number, hazard level, and all of this information has to correlate with, uh, with that particular design registration letter that we've got in hand. Now, next one is the documentation that uh, the supplier will provide. So once I manufacture the documentation, I'll have to generate uh, a document by by the name of Manufacturer's Data Report, or MDR, which looks very similar to this, and it has to look like this because it's actually the template of it is coming from Australian Standard AS4458. What it does, it reflects pretty much all the work that has been done in the background to date and during the manufacturing process. So you can say, yep, yeah, there's a design registration issued by the Victorian government with this uh, registration number. Uh, the serial numbers are here, the drawing numbers are there, the hazard level is calculated there. This is a design code, AS1210, and a bunch of other uh, information in there. This should suffice the owner's argument with the inspectors. That's pretty much all you, all you need to get your design, uh, the item of the plan, registered in some cases some operators especially in uh, more complex models if it's oil and gas or mining they may ask so for some some other documents like copy of the design registration or design verification certificate or pressure test report etc etc all those documents can also be provided on request now let's get down to owner's responsibilities uh, and uh, as part of that most important uh, item is in service inspection now if you've got a pressure vessel what do you have to do first we have to make sure that we are adhering to all those regulatory requirements including a design registration and item of the plan registration we've spoken about them in length second thing is we have to have a management system in place right and this management system will ensure that the uh, pressure vessel integrity is maintained over its life, whether it's through inspection process, whether it's through risk-based inspections, whatever it is, we just want to make sure that this management system, uh, through proper documentation, through proper inspection regimes and everything, checking the physical conditions, knowing where this uh, particular vessel is located, the history of repair, if there has been any or anything as such, uh, are kept in one place, right? So as the owner, you have to be able to present this to the inspectors or uh, anyone who from WorkSafe who will 
uh, come over to your plant and, and run an audit on the pressure vessels there. Now, as part of that, an item of the plant which is registered will need periodical inspections, right? The inspections, if you read the standard, right, the beginning say it can be done by a confident person. So who's the confident person? In terms of accumulators, it can be a hydraulic fitter, right? But if you, as a hydraulic fitter, decide to inspect an accumulator, you have to ensure that you've got proper uh, quality process in place, you know, you as an as a inspection body, you also have to comply with certain uh, regulations. And the company that you work for has to be set up for that purpose as well. So it's not just being competent. Therefore, there are organizations out there like ASIP, uh, which do certification of inspection personnel. And it's quite a, quite a uh, process to actually get your certification to be able to uh, go out and start inspecting different pressure vessels. So, and again, you know, once you uh, do your inspections, you have to be able to generate the documentation. And as the owner, you'll have to maintain all these documentations. Now, what are the objectives of inspection? It's very much about promoting safe, safety and health uh, of the personnel, you know, working in a particular plan. Not quite this guy is not even wearing a, a safety glass, but let's just ignore him for a second. Um, it's also important to, I mean, another objective of uh, S37, 37 or inspection as per 37 is complying with occupational health and safety legislation. Legislation is asking and calling for inspections, so we'll have to comply. Uh, and with the aim of obviously limiting the potential damage to the property and, and, and health of the personnel and protecting the environment. Right. Question will come uh, as when do we need to inspect a particular pressure vessel? It's not just a periodic inspection. There's quite a number of different areas and times that we need to uh, run inspection process. When commissioning uh, a particular vessel, you know, just to make sure that that vessel is not damaged in transport uh, or uh, it's fit for the purpose of that application. You know, one of them is periodic inspections. We'll get to that in a second. If there is any damage to the pressure vessel and we repaired it, you know, we want to make sure that we inspect the vessel, make sure it's intact. Uh, if there's a changing process, I don't know if I take an accumulator from an oil service and put it on a water service, right? Uh, I need to get an inspector involved to give us our, uh, give us their blessing that yes, this is in fact fit for purpose of the application together with obviously the engineers and the, and the owners and everyone uh, again uh, inspection after repair you know if i repair a pressure vessel like this how do i know this repair is uh, uh, is ticking all the boxes again we need to engage an inspector for them to do their due diligence remember inspectors are not engineers so they wouldn't know what thickness of a supporting plate you have to weld on this vessel right they will call for appropriate personnel, in this case engineers, and they will ask them to present uh, their supporting data and their job is just, you know, doing the due diligence on it. Inspection of the idle equipment, quite important. If you put one of these, one of these uh, vessels to idle after, uh, uh, you know, six months, there might be condensate accumulated in this vessel, you know, resulting in rust and corrosion. Uh, so you need to keep an eye on it and just make sure that in that idle period, your vessel uh, hasn't been deteriorated. And we've got inspection of remaining life. Uh, sometimes we allow for, I don't know, wall thinning or corrosion, but how do we know how much longer we can run this vessel for? So these are the areas that we need to uh, inspect the vessel and engage a pressure vessel inspector. As for periodic inspections, uh, AS 3788 uh, on table four, they do offer uh, inspection regimes for different types of vessels, right? Uh, accumulators being one of them on the 10 point, point 10 point one, uh, they categorize accumulators in three different groups. If the PV value, so design pressure times volume less than 100 megapascal liter, between 100 and 200, anything greater than 200 megapascal liter. Again, let's take a 50 liter accumulator as an example. Uh, it's got a PV value greater than 200 megapascal liter. And this one doesn't have any of those safety factors uh, factored in. 
So for a fifty liter accumulator, we need to do what? We need to do commissioning inspection. So when I put it in in operation, I have to run an inspection on it. Firstly, first yearly inspection. Yes, after one year, we need to inspect that and see that close. We'll get to that in a second. External inspection, and this is interval, so you have to repeat that every two years and internal every 12 years. And under cer certain circumstances, you can extend the interval, uh, uh, interval of internal inspections to a certain number of years. So let's have a look at this one, because the question is often asked that, do I really need to pull my pressure vessel apart and, and do a, run an internal inspection after one year? You know, if you, if you want to go by the standard, so under point uh, 4.3.3, they said that the first yearly inspection uh, shall be internal and external, right? But we are often asked, oh, that can be quite a quite a costly, costly exercise, right? Uh, after one year, well, we don't really want to pull this apart and, and have a look inside. If we want to obey the law, that's your obligation to do that. But the standard also offers some alternative methods of inspection. And the most, one of the most important uh, methods is the risk-based inspection. So again, this is an alternative to the suggested periodic inspection interval. And it's very much to down to understanding the risk associated with changing those intervals, right? So if you as the owner of the vessel, together with the inspector, together with all the stakeholders and engineers involved, get together and agree that there is a, it's not necessary to pull this apart, to put an accumulator apart after one year to look inside, because we know this is working in a factory environment, is a very cool hydraulic oil flowing through it, so there is absolutely no risk of corrosion. The service of this vessel is not going to change. And then do all your risk assessments. Get everyone in the process involved. Again, engineers, inspectors, plant managers, maintenance managers, operation managers, everyone who is a stakeholder uh, involved and agree that, hang on, there's absolutely no need for us to pull this apart. We've done this with some of, with some of our clients. We've actually participated in that risk assessment process. And we've been able to, uh, as inspector or inspection bodies, we've been able to give them concessions on uh, the first yearly uh, internal inspection. So uh, obviously it's important that to, to understand that whatever you do, it has to be agreed by an inspector, documented and enclosed in your documentation uh, archive. So if an inspector comes to you after 10 years and said, hey, show me your first yearly internal inspection, you can just take your concession letter out and show them that we agreed, you know, through these engineering processes, risk management and risk assessment, that we don't really need to do that. Uh, and we've been running the vessel uh, since then without any issue. Uh, and then you can tick all the boxes. So there is quite a fair bit to cover. If you're interested in actually inspection processes and other alternative methods of inspection, whether it's NDT, whether it's, I don't know, running an X-ray, also different methods that are out there, which are alternative uh, for, uh, you know, pulling, pulling a vessel apart and, and, and looking inside, uh, you can actually uh, download a copy of S3788 or purchase a copy of 3788 and read through those inspection processes, understand uh, what that entails and uh, what your obligations are with regards to the inspections. So thank you very much for listening. We uh, have a few minutes to answer some of the questions. Uh, so if you allow me, I'll quickly go through, through some of these questions that we've got here. Uh, so there is a semester, yep. Can we have a copy of this webinar? So this webinar will be published. Uh, this webinar will be published on the uh, on HIDAC website or an, and also HIDAC YouTube channel, uh, and you can actually access the webinar uh, for you know again if you want to uh, to see that again. Um, you can go through the YouTube channel. 
Uh, we've got another question. Um, what is the importance of this regulation for other countries? Well, uh, as I mentioned, you're going to have to have a look at, uh, you know, your country's workplace uh, health and uh, safety regulation acts uh, and comply with, uh, with the local rules and regulations. I'm personally not aware uh, of, uh, of those standards and, and regulations, but you can certainly, if, if there are organizations similar to WorkSafe or WorkCover, uh, you can uh, have a look through their websites and download their regulations and, and legislative acts uh, and find uh, regulations pertaining pressure vessels uh, in there. Another question is, are coolers concerned uh, for this regulation? So we have done uh, the hazard level calculations on relatively large coolers and heat exchangers and the PV value together with uh, the content value and locations and everything did inquire the stack up to hazard levels greater than uh, E. So uh, no, but if you've got a particularly a large cooler that you want to, uh, you want to consider, as a pressure vessel, uh, then we can run the calculations on it. it. It also comes down to the construction of the cooler as well, because some, some coolers, they just have a serpentine tube, for example, and piping are following different regulations. It's not quite AS1210 for the design, et cetera, et cetera. So the general answer is not really, but we can look at it in particular cases. So the last question is, why doesn't WA WorkSafe allows for other codes as they use older standards. So uh, this is an interesting one because we've got uh, from, I think five or six years ago, there were discussions around harmonizing be be between different states. So while WA may not quite accept different codes, they do recognize uh, design registration letters issued by other states. Why they don't accept different codes? That's a question for the regulatory authority in that state. But we know for a fact that if you want to get an ASME vessel, for example, in, in Western Australian market, we do that is we can do the design registration against ASME in Victoria and WorkSafe WA do accept and recognize design registration letters by Victorian government. So typically that's how, how we manage to get that over the line. But but again, I think uh, why they don't quite recognize a particular standard except for AS1210, that's the question that we need to ask uh, the WA uh, government and work health and safety uh, authorities there. So that's it. That's pretty much all the questions that we had. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, if you would like to uh, watch this video again, you can uh, go to HIDAC YouTube channel and, uh, and view the webinar there. Thank you very much for your attention.